question. So as you can see that I, I like to put fast as as my background, either virtual or in reality. So the picture you are seeing uh, was taken on uh, September the, the 4th and it's, it, it's real. Uh, there's a there's a observing deck uh, that open to the uh, tourist. So so this is another panoramic shot, and it's the fastest name in Chinese uh, is uh, uh, what uh, doctor just said uh, uh, a moment ago: uh, 500 meter aperture spherical radio telescope. Uh, so Mary Cruz's uh, from Max Planck made this. Uh, graph. Uh, so all the telescope here uh, are plotted roughly to scale. Uh, so within this uh, depression uh, that holds uh, fast, we can squeeze in our SIBO, Affelsberg, GBT, and Parks uh, physically. And uh, we roughly twice the gain, uh, instantaneous gain of our SIBO. Uh, we have 19 beam. Uh, it's a similar design to the Parks 13 beam and our SIBO seven beam, uh, just a more number of uh, beams. And we cover uh, about twice the sky since we can go uh, 40 degrees Zenus angle. So uh, that translates uh, into a declination coverage between minus 14 to plus 66. And the service, the combined survey speed, uh, if basically it's a product of the gain and uh, the uh, number of beams uh, is about uh, 10 times that of uh, our SIBO. So that's, uh, that's just a, a rough scale. Uh, so this uh, was taken from my cell phone uh, in the uh, middle of uh, 2018. So when the full system is uh, in operation. So it take only about a few minutes to hoist up this focal cabin that weighted uh, 30 tons that holds the 19 beam. And it's fully operated and fly around in this curved uh, aperture plane by six uh, very thin cables. It's, it's, it's almost, uh, it's just marginally perceptible. So it has a cross section of only 4.6 centimeter, but it's uh, stable enough and can sustain uh, hundreds of thousands of pulling and can move the cabin to a precision uh, down about one centimeter. And there's a further uh, refinement mechanism using six act actuators within the dome, is the so-called Stewart uh, platform. So, so this whole thing, uh, the final price tag uh, is about $180 million. And to put things in scale, uh, uh, you can use that to build uh, only about two uh, uh, subway stops in Beijing. Uh, so I, I, I always like to, to say it's a very cheap uh, uh, mega facility. Uh, and we have uh, five uh, proclaimed major signs go. So that's 21 centimeter line, uh, both in the galaxy and extra galactic and molecular spectroscopy, pulsars, uh, VLBI, and search for extraterrestrial uh, intelligence. And of course, uh, now everybody knows there's, uh, there's more sort of newer frontiers that uh, I will uh, mention uh, momentarily. And when we finished construction toward the end of 2016, uh, we only have this uh, so-called uh, ultra wideband uh, that uh, uh, it's a uh, collaboration between uh, Caltech, uh, the group led by Sandy Van Rapp, uh, who used this quad ridge design. So uh, uh, we, we cover uh, roughly 270 megahertz to 1.6 uh, gigahertz. So that's a frequency ratio of about six to one. And it's beyond the uh, the initial engineering design, but I proposed this to Dr. Nan and the FAST team and uh, uh, get this uh, relatively uh, cheap and rough receiver funded. So that uh, serve, uh, served well uh, in terms of co commissioning. Uh, it also managed to detect our first batch of pulsars. So this is the first pulsar discovery and uh, 
it's of course uh, we we cannot really see the neutron star that well, so it's a uh, it's a uh, it's artist's impression. But uh, within the walk, uh, it's real single pulse profile around 500 megahertz. So so that was announced on October 10th, 2017, and uh, just to demonstrate that that uh, we we are uh, progressing well uh, in terms of uh, com commissioning. And uh, the one, one of the last observation of the ultra wideband uh, was taken uh, earlier in 2018, and it it's uh, a, a one hour tracking uh, of a unassociated Fermi source from uh, 3FGL, and we found the uh, radio pulse and was later confirmed uh, by. Uh, Providing the ephemer, radio ephemeris to the Fermi team, and they 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 folded the data and found a, a, a very nice uh, a gamma ray uh, profile. So this is our first uh, millisecond pulsar discovery, and is uh, one of the faintest uh, uh, sort of radio counterpart of a gamma ray uh, pulsar, and uh, uh, it's just a. Uh, uh, demonstration of the uh, sensitivity uh, of fast in such uh, endeavors. And this is our first uh, uh, APJ paper. Uh, it is uh, about the 12th pulsar that we have confirmed. And it is a slow pulsar, but has uh, nulling mode change and sub pulse uh, drift. And there's uh, a plethora of uh, emission uh, uh, mechanism, uh, uh, including some of the weird ones, like when it starts to now, uh, it always look like uh, the the uh, one of the components in phase will turn off uh, first. Uh, I I can I just I cannot uh, really um, with my limited knowledge uh, about the geometry and the uh, emission mechanism, I, I I really don't have a coherent explanation. Uh, but the last sentence of the paper's uh, abstract says it's post challenges for a classic carousel type model. So I, I was quite excited by the results on, uh, uh, until uh, real experts like Dick Manchester told me that almost every uh, pulsar that uh, study in details or post challenge for the classic model. So it's, it's just a, uh, uh, another uh, example of uh, of what uh, what what we or the little we know about uh, such pulsars. Uh, so uh, by uh, the end of last year, uh, we have a special issue on uh, this uh, 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 astronomy journal uh, RAA. So that's a uh, uh, give some forward uh, look, uh, looking of the science capability of FAST and also uh, commissioning and testing result uh, in SDPMA. Uh, so that's uh, just a news blip uh, uh, in the IOP uh, website says that we, we are publishing some, the quantifying the uh, science potential of uh, the upcoming FAST system. So. So one of the stated goal of FAST is to, uh, to is to provide the next generation large scale uh, H1 sky image. The right now the 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 gold standard uh, is the lab survey, which uh, covers the the full sky at about half a degree beam size, uh, and uh, and the the one of the uh, com comprehensive data paper has more than. Uh, 2400 citations and it's uh, uh, the subsequent sort of better resolution uh, surveys uh, cannot really do uh, its own flux calibration. So uh, they only do relative calibration and tie the flux scale uh, to the lab survey. And the, the goal of FAST is to cover about 57% of the sky that's visible to FAST. And uh, uh, so 50% 7% of the full sky that's uh, uh, visible to, to, to FAST and has its own uh, absolute calibration. Uh, in order to do that, uh, there's a couple of things uh, that need to be uh, processed. There's a straight radiation correction, but also the how to calibrate the short time uh, uh, gain drift. 
So, so this is one of the raw image uh, from Arecibo. This is uh, just one layer of correction. So it's, you can see it's removed many of the scanning pattern and uh, uh, stripes. So the, the standard method of doing this is inject a electronic noise regularly. Uh, and then because you can calibrate the noise temperature of the, that electronic signal, uh, it pr provide a secondary calibration that, uh, uh, that you can use it to calibrate out the, uh, the uh, uh, short, short time uh, gain drift. However, if you inject that signal every second, it produces in the Fourier domain a one hertz signal. Not only that, it has its harmonics at two hertz, four hertz, eight hertz, and it soon mess up the power spectrum. Uh, the power level, uh, the magnitude of that uh, uh, noise uh, injection is so much stronger than any of the new pulsars that, that you are going to discover. So that is why, uh, one of the main reasons why uh, previously for single dish telescopes like Arecibo, Parks, GBT, Affelsberg, you name it, uh, people always insist on doing pulsar search and atron imaging separately. Um, but uh, since 2015, we realized that the, the processing power of the modern backends is such that uh, we, we have a hope of uh, processing the data differently and, uh, and just doing the survey once, but has different data streams. Uh, so the key concept is inject the noise much quicker than any of the pulsars, right? So, so the, the, the most quick pulsar is, uh, I think it's 1.2 uh, millisecond. Uh, so if we can really inject the noise much quicker than that, then the, 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 the signal in power spectrum and its harmonics would be pushed into much higher frequency. And we test that. So now we inject noise at the sampling frequency and uh, using the pulsar data to extract that scale, basically it's the t -cis scale and apply it uh, to the uh, spectral line data. And in the same time, subtract that noise uh, uh, out of the uh, pulsar. Uh, so, so there's uh, so so there, there's a patent that has just been filed and and this is all uh, working, and uh, we are uh, quite uh, proud of that. So so this is a uh, effort uh, led by uh, Mark Kirchhoff, uh, who also graduated from uh, Cornell University. So now uh, we have the inside of the ultra wide band uh, we have the 19 beam, and uh, it is placed in three rings. So between each beam, there's a, about a one beam width gap. So in order to put a com comprehensive full coverage, you can rotate the beam to a certain angle, then stack the beam up. And in this particularly uh, designed pattern, you can get 19 evenly super next sampled beam. Uh, and we can utilize the uh, spin of the earth. So to do just a drift scan, and the, the uh, equivalent integration time of a point source on the sky is about six seconds. Uh, but since we have a quite large gain, about 20 Kelvin per Jansky, uh, that's, that's still give us quite sensitive coverage. Uh, so to cover the full, uh, so 80 degree, right? We, have, we can do 40 degree Venus angle. Uh, so that uh, uh, require a little more than 5,000 uh, hours. So, so based on this noise injection scheme and the calibration and the pipeline and the 19 beam, we designed this survey so-called Commensal Radio Astronomy Fast Survey, uh, acronym as CRAFTS. And the, uh, the main concept was uh, described uh, in this uh, engineering uh, journal article. And uh, since then we have secured uh, more than 1500 hours of parks time and uh, a few hundred hours of Affelsberg time and through open proposals and, and other uh, efforts, we got uh, GBT, Arecibo, uh, uh, and some, uh, uh, to a smaller extent, GMRT time to try to follow up uh, Kraft's discoveries. So one of the main challenge uh, is data processing. Uh, so this is just a uh, rough estimate 
uh, if you sample at 100 microsecond, that give you uh, 10,000 numbers uh, per uh, second. And we have 4K channels, uh, full polarization, 8-bit sampling. Uh, so that roughly translate into say six gigabytes per second. It's much it's much quicker than any of the normal hard drive can write. So you you you, re you really have to parallelize the data stream and using or using a solid state drives, and it add up to about uh, ten to fifteen petabytes uh, for this one survey uh, alone. But uh, but it's uh, it's it's about the the uh, scale of the challenge we are facing. So now we are down sampling to two bits, and uh, also uh, try to apply uh, real time pro processing. So uh, and so so this is one of the effort. Uh, so we have a a real time pipeline to further compress the data from eight bit to to, uh, to two bits, and also. <clears throat> Uh, also, uh, because there, there's conceptually there, are, there are basically four backends, uh, so we can also throw away part of the band. For example, if you zoom in on the uh, galactic part, then you only need the the central ten megahertz. Uh, so then you can you can throw away uh, other band. Uh, so that effort. Uh, constrain our uh, data rate to about uh, one to 1.5 petabytes per year. So it's still uh, still challenging, but, uh, but it's, uh, hopefully it's uh, manageable for the foreseeable future. So we have also, particularly in Pulsar search pipelines, we, we have uh, spent some effort. Uh, now we have a full database for all the candidates uh, that uh, can facilitate the future uh, sorting and uh, artificial intelligence techniques. So that's, a, that's also an ongoing effort. So in terms of uh, H1 galaxies, I think uh, these are some of the very uh, illustrative work. Uh, so on the left uh, is a summary result from the Arecibo uh, survey. It's the Alfafa survey uh, with their full sample. So that's more than 30,000 galaxies. And uh, however, uh, only those uh, uh, shaded uh, area are, are complete sample. So, so which means the sample uh, become in, uh, complete when the uh, H1 mass uh, drop below 10 to the 9 solar mass. If you compare it to the optical, uh, a, a family of optical surveys, uh, right around about 10 to the 9 and uh, below that's uh, that's actually when the uh, comparison with the gas components start to uh, diverge. Uh, so, so we so for the nearby, uh, for the relatively local uh, universe, I think that's one of the main utilities of the craft survey uh, is that uh, we can detect uh, uh, about half a million. Uh, new H1 galaxies uh, with a median redshift of 0 0.07. Uh, so that's roughly 10 to 20 times uh, the size of the alfalfa sample. And it should uh, be fill up the, uh, the mass range, uh, uh, particularly between 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 8 solar mass. And since we are doing the H1 uh, imaging, uh, particularly for the local uh, velocity range, uh, so there is this uh, interesting topic of the gas between M31 and M33 from this uh, pioneering work by uh, Robert Brown. And then this further, uh, it's a deeper image and further resolved by uh, GBT uh, is from uh, uh, Wolf et al. Uh, in 2013. So, uh, so that took uh, GBT, uh, I think about 500 hours, so it's it's really a a, a, a heroic uh, effort. Uh, so what, one of the uh, topic that is still under research is that whether this gas is the relic of the interaction between M33 and M31, or is part of the halo structure uh, of M31. So there's uh, I, I know there's HST uh, absorption measurement and uh, a, a slew of other effort. And this is uh, a paper led by the Sydney University Group uh, that uh, together uh, we, we run this uh, 
uh, simulation. Uh, it's, it's based on the current proper motion measurement uh, from Gaia 2. So that allow us to tie the uh, model and basically run it backwards. Uh, so from about four giga years ago to now, and the uh, feature that uh, we, that there are two features to this particular model. One is that there is a very close uh, approaching about uh, six giga years uh, ago, and the the two system are uh, approaching again. Uh, and two, so th there will be a gas trail, not only between M31 and M33, but also uh, trailing strongly uh, M33. So, so that will be a particular feature we'll be, we'll be paying close attention to uh, in the fast image. And the H1 imaging part turns out to be uh, more difficult. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's expected. It's much more difficult than, than uh, pulsar search, uh, which is a time domain uh, periodic signal with uh, strong features. Uh, so on the left, it's a GBT uh, image of the part of the Lockman hole. On the right, it's a 2019 fast image. And below, uh, it's a different region, but it's 2020 image. So you can see that uh, we, we start to be able to, uh, uh, to do better uh, calibration and uh, removing the uh, scanning uh, pattern. So one of the next feature of the craft survey is that uh, every 24 hours, so every full night, we can detect uh, more, about 500 continuum sources. So that provides us a calibration grid. Uh, although right, right now we, we, uh, we, we haven't built up the proper uh, uh, pipeline, but, uh, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, in a few months to, to half a year, uh, we'll demonstrate that, that we can actually do uh, quote unquote self calibration and tie this uh, Quasar flux grid to the primary calibration source that, uh, uh, that has been constantly monitored uh, uh, by uh, VLA. So uh, turn, now we turn our attention back to pulsars. Uh, so this is a demonstration of the coverage of uh, some of the major surveys. So in the red uh, is the uh, PMPS uh, survey that uh, uh, has uh, produced more than uh, a thousand <laughs> new uh, pulsars. And there's uh, HTRU, uh, RSIBO, and GBT surveys. Uh, so between the, the red, uh, the dark and red lines, uh, uh, the, no, uh, the gray, uh, wait a minute. So the gray area is the GBT and the, the reddish area is PL um, alpha. And we uh, cover the, the little bit beyond the Arecibo uh, coverage. So the, the contours are the density of the new uh, expected detections. So a little bit south of the galactic plane that covered by Arecibo is our primary targeted area. So in those uh, blue uh, circles, there's actually uh, 300 new sources. If we look at the millisecond pulsar, the, this the expected discovery will have a higher scale height since the MSP tend to drift further away as so older uh, uh, neutron stars. Uh, so we are not there yet, but uh, I, I think I, uh, we'll end up with a much better census of the galactic neutron stars. Uh, earlier uh, this year, we pu published our first uh, systematic follow-up timing uh, result. So that's uh, work primarily done uh, by parks uh, that uh, follow up a group of uh, pulsars uh, uh, detected by the uh, ultra wideband. Uh, so further effort uh, is still uh, still ongoing. So, and uh, within about 150 uh, confirmed a new candidate, uh, we have now uh, actually more than 20 binaries, and uh, uh, we have solved uh, about. Uh, 10 of them, uh, including one double neutron star. Uh, but uh, we, we haven't seen uh, being able to measure its uh, uh, Shapiro delay. So uh, I think we will we'll probably uh, uh, accumulate uh, 
at least another year of data uh, to try to get a better uh, measurement. So we have this uh, uh, website, uh, crafts.bal.ac.cn. Uh, it's uh, open. It has the uh, list of confirmed pulsars with uh, uh, with uh, some relevant uh, information. So that's the PP dot diagram, and all those numbers. Uh, 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 it's a little bit outdated, uh, but uh, we, I haven't got uh, got around to update them. So, so this is a visualization of uh, all the uh, confirmed pulsars, and uh, it's largely based on uh, PRSR CAT. So, so some of the newer detections uh, that has been uh, uh, publicized but not published uh, in peer-reviewed uh, journal may be missed. Uh, uh, here. Uh, so the based on the uh, ATNF uh, PSR CAT uh, catalog, you can see that uh, at the start, there's our civil monoglo, but since the middle of 1990, it's certainly uh, dominated by parks. So that's the power of the first uh, sort of um, uh, uh, focal plane uh, array. And it still play a very active role and it's diversified uh since the uh like 2012 and uh since 2018 uh crafts uh it's it's a significant player uh and sometimes it's uh it's the leading sort of single instrument but uh but there are, there are uh, many other telescopes that are also very productive so this is a related work it's purely computational so what you are seeing here it's a, a, it's a simulated supermassive black hole binary population from redshift of two uh, to uh, within uh, redshift of uh, 0.2. And you can see the locus of this population uh, is the frequency and the magnitude. So uh, because the, the uh, black hole should uh, spin closer, uh, so it will increase in uh, frequency, and However, its 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 magnitude uh, will have this uh, this uh, this minimum in time. Um, so uh, the calculation uh, is a is a relatively simple calculation we just published on PRD. Uh, is that uh, with uh, SKA uh, we only need to constantly monitor about twenty high quality millisecond pulsars, and with that, uh, the SKA will start to detect single uh, uh, low frequency gravitational wave source uh, within five years and uh, achieve a detection rate of over 100 per year within 10 years. So at about 30 years, uh, then you have a sizable sample uh, of about uh, 10,000 that can uh, ha help us trace the uh, redshift evolution uh, up to redshift of two of supermassive black hole binary. So, so this is a more a SK work, but it's saying that uh, Park uh, Fast also, along with many of the other uh, major uh, instrument, uh, it should give us a a better uh, millisecond pulsar population to uh, choose from. So now turn to the some of the uh, more uh, newer topic. Uh, uh, Lorimer Burst was published in 2007, but it only become a respectful field uh, since 2013. Uh, and uh, Duncan uh, uh, used to make a regular visit to us, uh, and he, he has not been able to, uh, to, uh, to meet us uh, in China uh, this year. So even with the 19 beam, because our very limited field of view, we are uncompetitive in terms of detection rate. Uh, however, uh, we do have uh, unparalleled depths. So in uh, one of the uh, estimation by Bing Zhang from UN uh, LV, that it says that for some of the uh, stronger uh, FRB uh, already detected uh, fast may be able to detect the same pulse up to redshift of 10. And uh, right now we are running uh, several uh, pipelines, including the more uh, mature Hamdal. Uh, there's also the self-developed pipeline from Wei Wei Zhu, uh, who uh, adopted his uh, PIX pipeline and uh, it, 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 it utilized its own uh, uh, AI 
uh, routine to detect single pulse uh, in, into uh, uh, several dimensions. And so some of the recent uh, development has been published. So uh, we have been uh, discovering a new fast radio burst, uh, although it's, 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 we cannot uh, compete with time in terms of number. So, so this is the, the first uh, new uh, fast uh, radio burst uh, uh, detecting uh, crafts. And it's uh, led by Wei Wei Zhu. So it, it does have a relatively high uh, DM. So it's estimated uh, uh, close to, uh, estimate uh, DM redshift is close to redshift of two. It also have multiple peak, uh, which uh, is in common uh, for uh, repeaters, uh, but we haven't been able to find the uh, repeating pulse for this particular source. So these are some of the uh, new uh, fast radio bursts uh, from 2018. Uh, 2018 data, but uh, we managed to pr process uh, only uh, recently. And from the data of last year, uh, we found our first new repeater. And, and since it's a drift scan, uh, we, can, we can match the, the, uh, the uh, gain. And, uh, uh, and, and particularly for this one, uh, in, the one uh, in the discovery data, uh, it has about seven pulses within 10 seconds. Uh, so that, so one is, is very active and two, uh, it helps us to produce the initial localization. Uh, and th with that, uh, we have uh, managed to localize this with the new real fast um, system on VLA. Uh, so that's uh, happened on uh, July 21st. And so the, and we, we, are, we still have a, 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 a DDT program running right now. So as of a couple of days ago, we, we are still detecting pulses from this uh, particular source uh, with uh, both VLA and GBT. And, uh, and, uh, and it, it has a, both a pulsing source and a persistent source that seem to be uh, co-located, -lo but that's only like within 0.5 uh, arc, arc seconds. So we have a VLBA uh, program that, ho that hopefully uh, can give us a even better localization. And uh, luckily uh, we uh, have been able to identify the optical redshift. So that gave us a optical redshift about 0.2. Um, but it's the the imaging part is still very challenging since the the, the source seem to be around or even below 23 magnitude so we are hoping to we are proposing and also hoping to get further data but uh, uh, but I think this look more and more like uh, uh, 12 11 or two uh, it particularly it seemed to have a, a lot of local uh, uh, DM component. Uh, so it's so this source or whatever it is is being shrouded uh, by a large concentration of electrons. So you, you can make your own uh, story <laughs> uh, just from that uh, point of view. Um, since uh, later last year, uh, we have uh, installed and tested a, a dedicated uh, FRB and SETI backend. So it's basically a pulse detector. And uh, it was a collaboration led by uh, Dr. Randuan, who was a student of Sandy Van Rab and collaboration with the uh, Breakthrough team uh, in Berkeley. And with that, uh, we will manage to catch a, uh, uh, the, the act, uh, active phase of 12.11.02 uh, last, uh, toward the end of last August. So there's this uh, 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 ATAL announcement. And from the end of August to the beginning of no November, we have a campaign about 46 days. So there are several days in between that uh, uh, due to maintenance of the telescope, we don't take data. But we have a total of uh, about 59 hours. And within that 59 hours, we have more than 1,600 pulses. Uh, and that's, uh, that's more than quadrupled uh, all the pulses detected from all uh, uh, instrument uh, uh, since the 
uh, discovery of this source. So, so one of the, the striking features is that the peak birth rate uh, is about uh, more than 100 per hour. So that rule out any really uh, uh, catastrophic event. Uh, you, you really cannot be merging black hole uh, together at that rate. And, and another technical detail is that the, the pulse shape and uh, arrival time is really a sensitive function of the DM. Uh, so, so, I'm, so in this little animation, I'm just changing the DM uh, about 1,000. And it dr dramatically changed the pulse shape and the number of components. And if you also move the detection threshold, it will also give you a different width uh, of the pulse. So, so, so this uh, is really a cautionary note of the complex nature of the uh, uh, FRB emission. Uh, so combining uh, our data with the about seven years uh, of, of measurement, uh, it, it, it's very con consistent with the increasing DM of the source. So the uh, fitted increasing rate is about 0.85 per year. Uh, so that looks like a supernova, but, uh, but who knows. Uh, and we do have a very large scatter of the fitted DM within any certain day, but uh, the, uh, this trends uh, through the years seem to be robust. So the energy distribution or the fluence uh, distribution of the FRB has been commonly fitted by a log n log s uh, power law relation. So with uh, different sample give different index, uh, somewhere ranging between minus one to minus two point something. Uh, and we think, uh, we, not now we think, we demonstrate that I think that is simply an artifact of the uh, sensitivity cutoff. So here is the 121102 of the fast sample. It clearly has a characteristic peak. And that peak is margin, is at the margin of the Arecibo threshold, is unattainable to any of the other telescope, and it's about 20 sigma uh, for, for uh, a fast. So it's, it's clearly seen. And then we can fit this quote unquote bimodal distribution by a log normal. Uh, plus a Lorenzian function. So the log normal is, can be generally attributed to a stochastic process. And a Lorenzian function or a Cauchy Lorenzian function, uh, it's roughly described a steepening power law, meaning that you have lower probability of having a very strong or very bright pulses. So I, I will, uh, I will re refrain from saying any more uh, physics since I I, I have no confidence of, of any underlying uh, uh, model, but, uh, but I think this is a very clear uh, uh, observable uh, feature. So in terms of the operation, we just finished the, uh, the first round of open call for proposal. Uh, we have a close to 170 proposals and with a subscription ratio of 4.5 to one, uh, but the galactic plane time is much more competitive. I think it's roughly double that, since a lot of the pulsar program and stellar program are concentrated in the galactic plane. And, uh, uh, and it's, it's roughly evenly divided into six groups. Uh, and uh, 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 Inge Ma has, uh, uh, ha has been leading uh, a successful uh, program. The expectation, is to will gradually open to the international community from uh, next year. Uh, so the actual uh, percentage is being discussed, uh, but it will be somewhere between 25 to 20, 20 to 25% that will be open to the international community. So the CRAFTS uh, survey started in 2018 as a, a design, uh, now has been uh, approved by the science committee and uh, along with four other uh, programs. So now we have five uh, standing uh, surveys. So that's the craft survey, the galactic plane pulsar survey, uh, the M31 uh, imaging survey, uh, the uh, FRB follow-ups,
Hello? Hello? I think he's fallen off. So just, uh, yeah, he's come back again. Okay. Hi, Dr. Lee, can you hear us? Okay, um, let's just give a give a few minutes. I think he's uh, joining. Uh, uh, hello. Yeah, he's. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Can I? Um, I'm at back. Yeah, yes. I think you probably. I think you probably just reverse one slide back so that. Okay. Uh, I think we we stop. We yeah we stop there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, I. Apologize for, uh, for that. So <laughs> my uh, connection does does seem to drop uh, like every half an hour. Uh, so uh, I will repeat uh, what I said on this slide: is that the the craft survey now has been formally approved by the science committee, uh, along with four other programs. So that's uh, crafts uh, M31 imaging survey, galactic plane pulsar survey, uh, FRB follow uh, follow up survey, and also the pulsar timing. Uh, which has a, a major component of uh, PTA effort. So that's both follow up fast uh, own discovery and also spend a lot of time uh, on the uh, uh, IPTA uh, millisecond pulsars. So that's all ongoing. So uh, until the end of August, uh, we have finished about 10% uh, of the craft uh, survey. And uh, it's still still ongoing, but uh, I expect it's probably will take uh, uh, the data taking will take somewhere between five to 10, uh, 10 years at the at the current rate. Uh, and some of the more um, uh, uh, exploratory aspect, and the the uh, so all the large uh, uh, planets in the solar system has a radio burst. And uh, the, those uh, white square uh, uh, predicted radio bursts from exoplanet, but none of them has, has been uh, re, uh, sort of uh, unambiguously detected. And if we go along that empirical, uh, empirical relation, uh, radio bursts uh, was detected uh, from uh, brown dwarfs. Uh, so, so that there have been a a, a, a series of work uh, on both the theory side and the experimental side, and the plot showing here is uh, uh, just uh, a a collaboration. Uh, we made some prediction uh, for uh, fast, and this is uh, a most uh, recent work. So, um, if we going after uh, brown dwarfs. Uh, uh, in the crafts uh, survey, we uh, expect a total of somewhere between 100 to 300 uh, detectable radio bursts uh, from brown dwarfs. Uh, and we are targeting a, a bunch of them uh, with actually tracking observation. And there's, uh, we haven't found, found anything yet, but that's just, just something to, uh, to keep in mind. So as a summary of the craft survey, we uh, Hopefully, uh, after about 10 years, uh, we should have a thousand new pulsars, uh, half a million new galaxies, 10 billion voxels. So that's the spatial pixel times the number of uh, channels uh, at the velocity resolution provided by, by FAST. And a few tens of new FRBs uh, and maybe some uh, other uh, radio transient. Uh, so I will. Uh, close my talk by by a book I'm reading uh, uh, right now. It's a it's an excellent uh, uh, sort of personal perspective from Martin Harvard about the development of modern astronomy, along with some of the modern physics ever since the beginning of 20th century. So that includes relativity theory, uh, compact object, and and how people build up large uh, astronomy facilities. 
And what uh, really grabbed my eyes is at the start, uh, uh, Martin has this quote, is science is a craft. So I hope the craft survey will become part of the modern craft of astronomy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. That was uh, really interesting. Um, we have some time for questions. So I think the first question is from Dennis, uh, Dennis Ramonte. So Dennis. Yes, hello. Um, thank you for Hi. the nice talk. Um, so you, you were talking about the craft survey that will take between five and 10 years to complete. So is that to cover the full 57% of the sky that you mentioned yes. in the beginning? Yes, yeah, so, so it's, uh, uh, so it's, you take uh, about 220 full uh, circle scans. So that's uh, 5,000 hours. And, uh, and we were approved a little less than 500 hours uh, per year. So that would take 10 years. Um, but uh, uh, in the meanwhile, we, we are working up this scheme that uh, uh, we provide the craft's uh, observing mode and data compression and the basic calibration uh, pipeline to anybody who want to use it. So, uh, so if you want to, uh, if you can utilize the craft scan, uh, you are encouraged to 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 use the craft mode and uh, to also try to taking data on on a similar grid uh, and. In, in doing so, it saved the possibility that those data can be combined later, say five or 10 years from now, mm -hmm. uh, which actually was how the GALFA survey from Arcebo was built up. Uh, since it's very hard to any single team or single survey to really get the full time to cover the, the whole, whole sky, but, uh, but you can be doing your uh, specific science target and uh, and and then we can use that time to to cover some other part of sky and uh, 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 down the road, uh, it allow the uh, prospect that they can be put back together in a relatively uniform way. So so the uh, so so in the end, the craft survey is more like a a service uh, observatory survey, and it will. Uh, provide this data to the uh, community. I see, thank you. And um, at this stage, is there a, an idea of the final sensitivity of the survey in, ter in terms of, for example, H1 column density limiting detection? Right, so uh, I, so the, uh, let's see. So I think it's, uh, so it's six second, so in the, uh, in the John et al. 2019 paper, there is a uh, there is a graph, um, but it's it's I think it's roughly at at ten at ten to the eighteen. Ten to okay. Okay, so it will be only one uh, one pass over over different regions. Right. Um, right now, it's uh, uh, I don't think we will be able to get a comprehensive two pass coverage. Uh, so if there are certain area of uh, specific interest, it's, it's up to the respective team to lead a PI program to, uh, to provide further coverage. Thank you. Okay. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, so Dr. Lee, I have, uh, I have three questions. Uh, one is that I think for, for, uh, for us, which are cosmologists, we are mostly, um, uh, we are, we are the, uh, we, we really like the large scale survey the most. The, you know, like, uh, you know, how, how large coverage that would be so that we can cross correlate with other tracers, uh, you know, in, in multi-wavelength band. So in that sense, um, the five years plan, would five years plan roughly cover about, uh, uh, let's say a third of the full sky or a quarter of the full sky? Yeah, I think I think five years we should be able to cover uh, ten thousand square degrees. And the other thing is when you when you mention, uh, do you mind to reverse back to the plot which you show the changing of DM, which is really interesting. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So if you can see my pencil, I mean this is what. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So if you can see my pencil, this is what you observe. But but because the yeah. early data doesn't really have uh, much. I mean, as you said, there's a lot of dispersion. That could be the early data could also have some dispersion, which which really a flat line of non-changing non DM, right? Uh, I mean, I guess at the lower, at the early part, this part is kind of lack of data, isn't it? Right. Uh, um, so I think I think you, you I think you I I, I got your point. Uh, is that uh, um, I think the robustness of this trend depend largely on how well you trust the error bar of the first measurement. Yeah, or maybe the first measurement didn't sample, uh, I mean, enough so that it doesn't really observe the variation. But if there is, then they could be also, you know, vary, right. you know, quite a lot. Yeah. Right, right. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. And the other thing is, uh, can you show the merging of the binary black hole, the, the change of amplitude as a function of frequency? Yeah, I you explain why why the amplitude goes down and goes up again. Oh, uh, so so that's not of a single system. That's of the locus of the food distribution. So when you go to um, uh, sort of intermediate redshift, they are more um, because they're getting uh, closer. So you get a higher frequency, but also mean you can start to detect weaker, uh, uh, smaller mass sources. Oh, I see. So this is a statistical result. This is yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. not just one yeah, system. Okay, all the, yeah, so, so how this is done is, is a little bit um, rough, is that we take all the, um, all the infrared galaxies and assume a Bayesian predictor of which one, what a fraction of them being supermassive black hole binaries. And, uh, and then just, just use whatever assumed uh, parameter uh, to, 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 to calculate that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this can only be taken as a demonstration of the uh, potential of SKA, not the, the actual uh, gravitational wave signal from, from the galaxy. <laughs> Since we we don't know that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I see. Uh, can you? Uh, the other thing is, like, can you just briefly explain why at very low redshift like this one, the when mm -hmm. it's become uh, very low redshift, that the mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean we I mean the sensitivity does goes up. So I mean I'm expecting that we should be able to see quite low amplitude of the emerging system, but. This, this curve does goes up. Right, I think, I think when you, uh, I, I think that depends on the, how quickly you can get them to get closer. And there is a, a problem that uh, they call the, the uh, final parsec uh, 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 problem. So you, you start to accumulate sources. And uh, then when you get, really really close uh you it's because of it getting close so even those a smaller mass system now start to produce higher magnitude and the, the source just pile up on so it further increase the average the further increase in frequency because they are uh, totally getting closer but they're getting closer very slow, so the source basically power, power it up on. But because it's getting closer, you 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 also raise the magnitude. Okay, I see. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. But but all this is very <laughs> hypothetical, right? <laughs> it's just. <clears throat> so, so this is all model like model predictions, right? This right, this and this paper, is all PRD. model and, and only circular orbit, and you know it's a it's a, it's, a, it's basically a a, a, a a as I said, it's a it's a demonstration that that how this may be detected, not what it should be. So his comment was, um, I was saying that twelve seconds on NGC three five two one. 
what is it? Pilot observation by Ming got us down to 10 to the power 18 in column density. So that was his command. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And the question he was asking is, what is the state of the M31 H1 survey? Oh, so uh, so that's a survey led by uh, one of my colleagues in NLC. Uh, so I haven't really got around to process that part of the data, but uh, the the uh, uh, the the main uh, disk and large part of its envelope of M31 has been covered. Thanks a lot, Dr. Lee, uh, for um, giving us this uh, wonderful talk, and thanks everyone for joining in.